Good afternoon, everybody. We're joined by Bryn Kelly of The Fundamental Angle. Bryn joins us and is uh, breaking down the energy markets and uh, more specifically, typically natural gas and electricity. And today we just had natural gas uh, uh, data come out. And so, Bryn, how are you? Good, good. How are you doing? I'm great. Uh, been an active day. And so that's always good for our business. And I know natural gas had some figures come out. Uh, what did you see in the, in the data? Yeah, so um, this week's report was 86 injection. And, you know, it's kind of the same story week after week. It We're within a few BCF either side of expectations. I think um, we were a couple BCF over this week on people. Some people had figures around 82 to 83. Um, and yet it's hard to call anything a bearish number in a kind of a, I guess, overall bullish con you know storage picture um so you know we're, we still are below the five-year minimums i think the interesting thing on this report this week was that we finally saw some injections in the south central um they've been pulling or sort of flat the last several weeks and you know a lot of that is i'm sure due to this the backwardation of cash um, and, you know, the waiting game of, you know, being able to buy cheaper in October. And I think <laughs> now that that's the last month really to, you know, pick up some gas to fill up storage, you know, the, the market can kind of get in front of that a little bit. Um, I'm not overall, I'm not saying that's a real bullish sign. I'm just saying that now that we're seeing that bid show up a little bit, um, you know, you, you can see that maybe those injections in the South Central might start to pick up. When you have October, like 14 cents discount to January, you know, you still can, you know, buy it and, and put it away and, and capture that spread. But, you know, it's come in a lot and, and those margins are, are decreasing. So it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, kind of what plays out in that for the next couple of weeks. Just looking at the reports overall, um, I like to look at the two seasons. I always look at the, the summer season and, and that injection picture compared to prior years. And then after um, that contract expires, I'll, I'll do the same thing um, on withdrawals throughout the winter season. So, so we have 23 weeks in the bag and we have seven weeks left to go before the storage futures contract expire. I think they're sitting around 3304 or something like that. Um, so, you know, from a, if, if you didn't look at storage levels and you just looked at what we've been putting in so far this summer and, and what we've been averaging week to week, it doesn't look that bad. Um, it's certainly not below the five year average uh, in, in that way. It, we're only below the five year average in that we started at lower levels um, than we had in a while coming out of the winter season. So looks like we've averaged about roughly around 60 a week injection. Um, and of course that average is low due to the first two weeks of the season in April being with draw small draws. And that really means we need to inject for the next seven weeks around 84, 85 to hit that 3300 level. I think everybody sort of noticed the um, rally, I guess it was on Monday, off of the lows that, that we were kind of sitting down around 280 and now we're in the 290s. Um, I mean, it's kind of sad to talk about such small moves, but it's the biggest move we've had in a while in the contract. And if you take a look at how cash has been pricing out every day this month, um, we kind of started the month at Henry Hub cash was priced around 293 dipped a little and and actually yesterday traded for today um, today's cash managed to trade above three dollars for the first time this month and again I think some of that's due to you know just having to fill up um, those storage containers as you will here now as we're getting to the end of the season. Um, and so that's helped with such backwardation. That's just really helped pull the October contract up. Um, I would say it's October is generally a much lower demand month. 
um, than September is, and hence the reluctance to pay September prices for the entire month of October. Um, but there are some factors that, that could lead to that. Um, but mostly cash has been the driver that's pulled um, the October futures up a little higher. And, and October actually even went backward dated over November um, by as much as four cents. Wow. So where what we look like now is, you know, yeah, I, I like to look at in the past seasons, what we've drawn down from this, you know, start of the winter season to the end of the winter season. And the two big years that stick out are the 2014 cold winter year and last winter, actually, which was fairly cold. Um, and if you ever imagine that we would probably take out around 24, 2500 um, in a cold year, and you know we reach 3,300 at the end of the year. You can see where people, you know, they want to kick the can down the road a little bit, right? They're like, all right, so we might end next season, you know, or we might come out of the winter at a low level, and we'll deal with that problem next summer. Um, but right now, there isn't. I mean, summer 19, those mar those prices are just stuck. They've been stuck for a year, so there isn't any buying that we're seeing back there, um, which, you know, would help to kind of support everything else. But, you know, there's just no ax to grind by, you know, so consumers from that standpoint, because really they're all being pitched so many different options. You know, they're, it's not just natural gas that these utilities, you know, are trying to choose from, you know, they're being pitched renewable options, they're being pitched um, demand response programs, they just, they have so many options that they're dealing with, that it, it's not just as simple as, you know, run out there and, and buy the natural gas strip. Plus, with the shape of basis in some of the Northeast markets, if they buy the calendar strip, they really end up being short a bunch in the winter and long a bunch in the summer with the way that that, <coughs> and, I'll, and I'll show a chart on that in a second. So just for this week, we have October options. They expire in five days. Um, it looks like the big open interest is right in the range that we've been trading in all year, the 270 to three. Um, at the 290 level, but, you know, kind of got a pretty big open interest and, and you could imagine them trying to pin it there. Um, however, it looks like they're trying to, you know, make a run for maybe a couple of those higher strikes. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, you know, it was pretty interesting on Monday. It was, I guess it was Tuesday, actually, we had a big move from about 80 uh, 281 up to uh, almost 294. And, you know, even more recently, you know, we held that level and here we are still 294. Yeah, and that goes back to, you know, on cash, right? We uh, last week, the end of last week, Henry Hub cash was around 285. And then we walked in on Monday and there was cash, you know, 297 and then 305. So that just tends to put a little bit of bid in, you know, sure. the the futures market as, as we kind of get closer um, to expiration. So the, the way the, you know, natural gas, it gets a little pesky. So on Friday is when the weekend package, the three-day weekend package trades for cash. And generally, it's a weaker package overall because you have to take the Saturday and Sunday to get Monday. Um, and, and people just don't generally, especially as towards the end of the summer, they don't want Saturday and Sunday. And it tends to drag the market down. So I wouldn't be surprised if um, something like that happened tomorrow. And then we come in again on Monday and as they start trading cash for Tuesday, it has a chance to go bid again. But, you know, if they fail through that 290 level, I would, it wouldn't be surprising um, since, again, like I said, we, we've got weekend cash trading tomorrow. And, and the October contract now is reacting so much to where cash is trading as we're getting closer um, to expiration and pricing out the month of October. So what I have here is just the um, nuclear status reports. I want to do a little hurricane update. Um, so I think I talked last week that, you know, the Virginia region or Carolinas, north and south, they're not really gas 
consumers from a power production standpoint. It's, it's generally nuclear. And this is the nuclear status report before the hurricane hit and then today, this morning. And there are four units that are offline. We know that they took the Brunswick units offline, although you can see this morning, it looks like Brunswick two might be starting to ramp back up. You see this little 15% power. Um, and typically that might lead to some gas demand. However, where those Brunswick units are located is down in Wilmington. And for the most part, that whole area has been sitting without power. And so they take the plant down and, and the customers are offline. So there's nothing really to replace. Um, however, these other three um, units, and, and it's kind of similar across the region that units are starting to come down um, for turnaround season. That is, um, I think, also just kind of putting a little bit more of a bid in the cash market. Um, and, and just when, what I have here is the turnaround season for um, power plants. And, and these two graphs are for PJM, which is um, the Northeast, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, but it's the biggest pool, so I always look at that one. Um, and you can see the one on the left is outage season for this past um, March, April, May time frame, and then we have the forecasts um, for this upcoming turnaround season. And the big months are April and October by design, because that's generally when um, demand falls off quite a bit. However, in a way, you can think of this like, almost like a commitment of traders report, um, in that it, it makes the market more short if some other conditions happen, right? So as last April, we actually ended up having cold weather um, for the first few weeks of the year. And, and that kind of led to pulling molecules out of the ground versus putting it in. We, you know, there's certainly some of the weather forecasts look like they're showing um, some weather anomalies for October, you know, colder and warmer in different places. Um, what you really want is either warmer, warmer, warmer than normal, um, or, you know, much colder or much, yeah, much colder, especially on the East Coast. The East Coast, it's better if um, it's hot and they're running the air conditioners longer than, than you might expect. Um, and the Midwest being colder, you know, kind of gets them into heating degree days. So, so it's possible that, you know, we could run up on, you know, we've got a storage bid in the market and we've got you know, starting the second week, first, second week of October, we're really get into the heart of maintenance season. Um, and it's not ins insignificant, you know, I mean, you take 50,000, 45, 50,000 megawatts off, megawatt hours offline for um, maintenance. And, you know, you, you, it's not as if the market doesn't have the capacity for that, but you are into more expensive um, generation in the stack. Hence, you can pay a little bit more since clearing prices in, in the power pools will go up. And just to take a look at that, this is PJM. Um, the orange line is uh, the daily clearing power price. And then we have that with the backdrop of demand, the demand forecast and the realized um, peak demand. Um, and, and it's compared to, from a demand standpoint, the five-year average. And really, for the last several weeks, demand has definitely, on the power side, been exceeding um, five-year averages. And we've seen that in how prices have been clearing in, in the pool. I think for the month of October last year, on-peak prices averaged just a little bit over $35. And, and we keep having these spikes um, in the last few weeks, last 10 days here, of, you know, definitely jumping up into the 60s and 70s, and it's bringing that average a lot higher. So that also gives some breathing room to the upside for natural gas temporarily, since um, the marginal, you know, fuel unit cleared allows for a little bit more expensive gas 
um, input, uh, you know, on the fuel input side. So that's something to watch. And again, I, on the bottom here, I kind of layer against that the um, unit outage, outage forecast. And, you know, we're sitting down here around 10, 20,000. And when we take this up at the peak to 50,000, it essentially makes, you know, you add that on with what the peak demand is. And, and they look like some pretty significant demand days. And so, um, you know, it's something definitely to keep an eye on. Um, the weather finally for October um, matters. And, you know, if, if you want any kind of volatility, let's hope for some anomalies from that standpoint. Um, and then just a review of the overall futures market. I always like to look at the complex at some of the producing regions, um, North, you know, Permian, and then up in the Appalachian region, um, and the LNG market, as well as ethane. And, you know, LNG futures have just been on a tear this, you know, the last several months. And, you know, you see you have Asian LNG above $13 for Jan and Feb, but even UK net gas has continued to rise. I think several weeks ago or a few months ago, the front of the UK curve was pricing below US Gulf Coast LNG, which you know, it makes for an inverse spread as far as exports go, but now it's pulled itself back above um, you know, those Gulf Coast LNG numbers, partially due to the exchange rate, the British pound, since it's priced in the British pound, um, which helps anyone selling over there um, on those margins. And then ethane, um, and I, I know I've signaled this before, but ethane continues to make new highs almost every day and, and for the last several months. Um, and it's almost up to 850 in MMBTU terms in the, the front of a few contracts. There's a couple things going on. There's um, some, there's a frac plant down so they're, they're running into a little bit of tight frack space. Um, the costs have gone up. So, so for fracking ethane into ethylene, some of those costs have gone up. And as a result, um, a lot of producers are rejecting the ethane back into the natural gas stream simply because they can't um, get it to market to get those prices. Um, and, and a lot of export contracts have come on as well. So. It'd be interesting to see if, if that market changes a little bit and, and some of that ethane comes out of the natural gas stream. Um, you know, I think there might have been some expectation that would have had more of an impact and, and so far it's not. So, um, but you know, once some of those constraints get lifted, I, you know, there is some opportunity for, for the market to find itself in a different place than it expected on a supply demand balance. Um, I, I always like to look at the injustice on the East Coast and especially like Boston and around Massachusetts um, through, through futures prices. And right here, I'm just comparing, you know, the winter strip in, at Henry Hub and the winter strip at Algonquin, which is the city gate delivery for Boston. And, you know, it's hit up to 1150 now for January and February. And, it, you know, it, honestly just amazes me that there isn't, you know, we never, you never hear any real consumer outrage on that, you know, winter after winter. And, and this goes back to, um, and even the slide before anybody buying, you know, if you, if you take this Algonquin strip, the 12 month strip and average it out, you, know, you get something closer to Henry hub prices. However, your big demand is in the winter. Um, and, and you really have no demand in the summer. And so you end up in a situation where you're short and having to cover in the most premium months and you're long and having to sell at the most discounted months. And it kind of exacerbates the whole thing um, because people don't like to go out and, and buy something with an 11 handle on it um, for their customers. It just doesn't work very well with their formulas. So they'll buy a percentage of their demand through calendar strips and then um, basically buy in the spot market or buy as it gets closer. And, and this year, these futures are just not giving it up. Um, and it also exacerbated, you had that Columbia gas 
explosion in that neighborhood in Massachusetts, which was terrible. And, and I think we'll still wait to see how that plays out with NYSource, um, that's their parent company. Um, and, and really what, you know, where these futures head um, prior to, you know, expiration um, for the January contract. And, and I think that could even just lead to so much daily cash volatility within that market. So, so there is a lot, there, there are big prices in natural gas. They're just, they really don't get talked about. I mean, I, just, you don't really hear if you just don't hear it from the consumer side. And, and I don't think I'd, I'd be that thrilled if I was an informed consumer and understood that infrastructure just completely put us at such a disadvantage. But anyway, that's just my two cents. It yeah, continued. well, that's what you've showed us pretty clearly more recently. That's a part. Yeah, it just, it just, it, I don't know, it's annoying to me. I feel like, you know, what, what market, it doesn't at this point matter what the market signal is because from a regulatory standpoint, they just can't get it done. They just can't get that pipeline across New York. So, um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen there. I, a couple of utility um, friends that I talked to out there, uh, honestly, you know, think at some level there needs to be a catastrophe. That's the only thing that will move um, those markets into action. So I don't know, maybe this is the year we'll, we'll see. Um, certainly don't want that for anyone, but, um, but you know, you, otherwise you just can't shake these anti-pipeline people, you know, and the, the regulations around that, it, it, you, just, you, can't, you can't shake it. So um, here's, this is just a chart of the frac fees I was talking about earlier. Um, and I think even Monday, or it might've been last Friday, if you looked at the ethylene future strip and ethane, it, ethane was really only you know a negative margin for the October futures, but now kind of the whole first six, the whole winter strip really has flipped above. Um, and, and so I guess we'll see what that looks like for some of these producers and, and some of these owners of the plants. But you know, the lot a lot of volatility and a lot of new highs being made there, um, which is nice for those that have an NGL stream. Um, you know, it almost, and, and those that can get it to market, um, they've been making enough on their NGL stream, you know, that it's all right, that natural gas prices themselves just kind of sit here and at where they have all, all year, because they're basically earning an upgrade premium on, on other parts that they weren't expecting. Um, and, and here's the, just kind of the last thing, or I suppose maybe I'll, two, two final things. Just again, I like to highlight the LNG spreads. Um, and I, I break them down looking at two things, the transport spread and the liquefaction spread. So first you have to take the natural gas from the US and liquefy it. Um, and then you have to get it from the Gulf Coast. And I, I'm just looking at Asian LNG futures. So the spread from Henry Hub to Gulf Coast LNG is up around 750 now. So clearly compensating those um, who have those plants. And then the spread to get it from there over to Asia is, you know, a buck fifty to two fifty. And that was negative earlier this year. So it just speaks to the demand for winter gas that that the rest of the world is starting to see and how much they're having to pay for that natural gas. Um, you know, not really the cheap solution that we have here and, and not even everywhere here, but, but those spreads are now positive and, and in the money. I think it's maybe an estimate of $1.50 to $2 for that voyage over to Asia. So at a $2 frac, you know, transport spread, and that huge liquefaction spread, it, it's um, good times for those that have spare LNG capacity. I know that Chenier just got um, the go ahead to bring um, feedstock gas into their train five. So that, that should, we should maybe see some impact from that in the fourth quarter. Um, and, and maybe that's just another area that tends to keep cash a little bit tighter. I think what we're gonna see is that 
the front month contract is, is, you know, fights it, fights it, fights it. And then as it gets to expiration, it sort of has to come up to cash prices. And, and we've seen that all summer. And I think, you know, we'll just continue to see that versus someone running in and, and just outright buying um, the winter months because they think they're cheap. I think I'll save that one for another time. So that, that's an update from here. Um, look to see what Weekend Cash does tomorrow. Look to see what options expiration look like on Tuesday. Uh, I think the market would love to see it make a move towards $3, but you know, I, I don't know, it might have too many headwinds ahead of it. Um, so I'd, I'd like to see it move to $3 at expiration since those are lottery tickets laying around for now. So, uh, yeah, but which it, probably I, means- I, I saw you put some cheap <laughs> option opportunities out there, especially on that big day uh, up. Uh, when we had that move from 281 to 292. So we'll definitely keep an eye on that. And so there, there's still a few more days. Uh, and as you saw, you know, we can move 10 cents pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, yep. So we'll see, um, you know, how the market fares through tomorrow. If we can stay strong through tomorrow, I think there's a chance, you know, at the upside for Monday, Tuesday. Interesting, interesting. All right, well, thanks a lot for the information. A lot of great information. That's Bryn Kelly from The Fundamental Angle. Thanks for joining right. us. We'll talk uh, next week. Thanks. All right.